Diana Anderson is the CEO of Cilient and the creator of Cilient's unique approach for instilling changeable coaching cultures. Forbes calls Diana a pioneer in the creation of coaching cultures. Diana started her coaching career in the early 90s and has taught coaching at the graduate level at Drake University and co-authored Coaching That Counts, a widely recognized source for the business case on coaching in organizations. Additionally, Diana was one of the first graduates from Coach University and a founding member of the International Coach Federation. And Diana will be presenting today, Is Your Organization Ready for Behavior Change at Scale? With that, Diana, I'd love to hand you the microphone. Thanks so much, Charlene. So good to be with everybody today. Um, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you about is your organization ready for behavior change at scale? Because I personally believe that your ability to actually invite people to think and act in new and different ways is going to be a key differentiator for the success or potential failure of your organization going forward. The reason that I believe that um, is because of my background in change management. Um, I started off doing large-scale change management with process companies back in the 90s and then transitioned into instilling coaching as a culture um, when I co-founded uh, Cilient, um, oh gosh, over 20 years ago. And what I want to share with you today are some of the insights that I've gained about why behavior change at scale really matters and what it takes to do it well. And I wanna leave you with some really practical ideas about what you can do to really prepare your organization to succeed in this area. So to start with, what I want you to give thought to is what kinds of really significant challenges is your organization facing right now? And Charlene, if you would um, maybe put that into the chat, I'd love to hear the kinds of things that people feel are really strategic kinds of initiatives that you need to be giving attention to in this moment in order to really thrive going forward. But I'll give you some examples that, of things I'm hearing. You know, some are discovering what's next. I mean, are you looking at moving into a hybrid uh, work environment going forward? Did your organization make some big declarations about diversity and inclusion commitments that you're now looking at honoring and giving thought to how you're really gonna make those come alive? Or are you one of the organizations that's really struggling with changes to your supply chain or maybe to uh, client or customer demands and, and really kind of trying to figure out or maybe even finding out how you're going to get enough people to meet these uh, challenges that you're facing? Or perhaps you're in a conversation of what leadership looks like now in this much more fluid world, um, or even preparing for what comes next in terms of another disruption. Or maybe you're doing all of these things um, and maybe even more. Sherlyn, did we hear anything in the chat of um, people um, sharing with us challenges that they're facing right now? Uh, not just yet, we posted it, but I'll let you know as soon as I start to hear back. Okay, well, cool. Well, so what I'd like to, as you're thinking about it, and whether you post something or not, I think it would be really helpful as we go through this conversation for you to have that challenge in mind. As I take you through these different concepts, I want you to be thinking about how's that going to apply to me in my organization? And are we really ready to engage these, um, these really complex challenges at scale? So here's the first question I wanna ask you is like, what do these challenges have in common? Well, the first thing I tell you is there's probably no clear ownership. That is, it doesn't belong to the, to the operations area. It's not completely an L&D issue. Um, it's something that's going to cross a lot of boundaries and a lot of borders. There's also probably no real definable outcome. <clears throat> it's not gonna be a project that you're gonna be able to put uh, a flag in the ground at the end and say, hooray, we did it. Pretty much everything that I pointed to um, is going to be an evolving process that's gonna to continue to change as the environment that we are working in changes. And um, there's also probably no roadmap. If you, you're not gonna be able to go out and do uh, benchmarking or best practices 
because we're all figuring out many of these things together. But here's what I would absolutely tell you is most in common for all of these things is that they, none of them will be successful unless your organization is able to behave and act in very different ways than they are right now. That is not only to address these issues, but also to instill whatever outcomes we define, your organization is going to have to think and act differently. They're gonna to have to ask questions they've never asked before, have conversations that they've never had before, um, think about processes in ways that maybe we haven't had to really engage before. So we've got to think about how we're going to handle this change. And I think the first thing we actually have to change is how we think about change itself. That's because we tend to think of change like it's a project. I know that when I was in process re-engineering, we had a very structured way of approaching, you know, huge process re-engineering or uh, uh, projects that could encompass an entire company. But we would take a look at what was happening now. We would decide what we wanted the future to look like. We would put in a bunch of, um, you know, uh, outcomes that we needed to uh, hit, a, a lot of, you know, different uh, paths that we were going to do. And then we would, you know, just go at them until we hit the finish line. And if we needed people to change along the way, well, we would usually just tell them what they needed to do differently. We'd say, hey, here's just all the stuff you gotta do. And as you can see that, that often didn't work out that way. And that's because changing things is very, very different than changing people. Things respond really well to a project-oriented, structured approach to change. But when it comes to changing people, well, it just turns out that they actually have to choose to change. <laughs> we can't just tell them to change. And as a result of that, we've got to give thought to what is it that inspires people to change? And I would tell you that um, after 25 plus years of coaching, um, and watching people change at scale, I would tell you that people change when they believe that they can win. So let's take a moment and, and think about what does it mean to win when it comes to behavior change? The first question that people really give thought to before they're willing to invest in change is what's in it for me, okay? and. That's because change is not easy, right? I mean, if you think about any kind of major change that you've engaged in, it's gonna take a lot of effort. It's gonna take a lot of practice. Um, and there's gotta be something in it that's worthwhile for you to want to invest in that. I think the most important question that people ask themselves, and I think one that we as L&D professionals often don't give enough attention to is, is it actually safe to change? If you think about it, change is a pretty high risk maneuver. If I have been successful doing something right up till now, and now all of a sudden you're telling me that I have to do it differently, there's a lot of questions I've got about how much risk I'm putting myself at, both personally and professionally to engage in that change. And lastly, people want to know, well, okay, if I make the change, how's it going to make a difference? You know, how am I going to be able to actually get the payoff that I invested to get? Is there going to, how are we going to make, turn this into something that's useful, both to me and to the organization? So let's take a look for a moment at how we help people win at scale. Because it's one thing to do that individually. I mean, that's what we do as coaches all the time, right? Is take people through that change process. But when we need to change people at scale, well, it's a different kind of thought process. Although I would tell you that the same concepts apply. So the first thing that we've got to ask ourselves is what's in it for me? And by the way, that can include us, all right? Um, you know, purpose, 
is so, so, so important these days, um, particularly to our younger um, you know, generations. They want to know that they're making a difference in the world. And I would tell you that when you are inviting your organization to consider doing something differently, whether it's wiring up a more just and equitable culture, whether it's thinking about treating people in a different way so that you can keep those valuable resources that you've got, or whether it's approaching your customers and clients in a different way because the world has shifted as a result of all that we've gone through, Whatever it is, you want to share this as a story. Please don't give a bunch of bullet points, okay? What you want is some kind of story that helps people see why the change matters and how it's gonna be helpful, not only to them personally, but to people collectively. <clears throat> and a really, really important part of that story needs to be, what's it mean to be a good and effective leader now? Because if you think about it, all of those changes that we were pointing towards in the beginning, you know, um, culture change, operational change, um, any of those kinds of changes, if we approach it with our old leadership style of telling people what they should do, um, why what they're doing is wrong and what they should do now, we're not going to get the kind of outcomes we need because people don't change when they're told to. People actually change when they feel inspired to do something differently. And so it's important that we help our leaders understand why they're gonna to have to lead in a different way to achieve the kinds of outcomes that we're looking at. One other thing I think you really want to incorporate into this story of change is to set much more reasonable expectations about what the change process itself is going to look like. I would tell you that probably one of the main reasons I see large scale change management that involves really significant behavior change fail is that the people who are evaluating or judging that project or supporting the project think about it like a project that's supposed to have an end result and don't actually understand that when we begin to really change people's behavior, that it takes longer, that it requires a different process, which is what I'm gonna explain a little bit more to you about now. But I think it's really important as we think about sharing with people why significant change is important, that we include the expectation of what it's gonna to take to be successful. And Charlene, by the way, if I, if anyone's got questions for me as we go along, please feel free to chime in and, and let me know about those. I would be happy to stop at any time. Yes, Diane, actually, this would be a good opportunity. I'd love to squeeze in. We have a question here um, with a comment. Mm -hmm. We are working on evolving our efforts toward a coaching, coaching culture. Any best practices, tips for leveraging and aligning all the resources one might have access to so there's alignment and support versus competition and confusion? Oh, wow. Wow. So, so yay on the coaching culture. And I really think it, we'd have to talk a little bit more about what all the various elements are. But what I'm talking about right in here is this shared understanding of what it is and why it matters, I think is really important. Um, by the way, when it comes to a coaching culture, I think one of the places you really do want to begin is a shared conversation about what coaching actually means. Um, to everyone. And you want to get like one version <laughs> of what that is. Um, often what I find happens is um, because coaching has been, that term has been used in so many different ways and expressed in so many different ways um, that often people have something very, very different in mind. And so I think it begins by casting um, uh, an idea of really truly what coaching is and then connecting it to how it really is gonna add value. Um, and then personally, you'll, as you, you'll see as I move through the, next, the rest of the, um, this piece, I'll show you some ways to actually bring some alignment around that. So hopefully that will help. Um, but great question, thank you for that. And feel free uh, again to come back um, as we move through this if, if there's some things I haven't addressed. 
So the next question we've really got to ask is, is it safe to change? I cannot overemphasize how important it is as you're thinking about engaging people in behavior change to really think about how they're gonna think about engaging in these skills. So the first one is like, am I gonna have the skills to do something successfully? You know, again, if we go back to this idea of creating a more just and equitable culture, well, people might have the great intention to lead and interact with others differently, but if they don't feel like they've got the skills to have those conversations or to recognize where they tend to trip up, they're not going to want to try. And they also want to know, am I going to get some support? Like if I do try to engage in these, these new behaviors, who's going to help me make sure that I get it right? And, and what happens if I don't get it right? Am I going to get punished? Will I be ostracized? <laughs> you know, will something happen to me if I'm not successful? We want to be thinking about all of these things as we're engaging people um, to take the risk of changing. Which is why I believe that building the skills to make change a way of life is actually the foundation for all of these things. Because when people feel like they, and so let me just take you through what that means to me. Um, I think that foundational change skills, so the ability to change behavior, begins by helping people just have the skills they need to have conversations about things that really, really matter to them. Um, we watched a lot of people stumble as they went through the pandemic. They could see there was things that they needed to talk about, but they weren't quite sure how to engage in those conversations. And as a result, I think a lot of them didn't happen. The other thing is, you know, we talked about how many different organizations and different parts of the organization are going to come together um, and have to have conversation, one of the key things you've got to be able to do is actually appreciate the different worldviews and perspectives that are being brought into the conversation. And do so in an appreciative way that helps people feel included in the conversation. Because one of the things we've collectively got to do if we're going to change behavior is to be able to look at the assumptions and beliefs that are driving the behaviors we're engaging in now at scale and start to challenge some of those. So an example might be, you know, going back to my idea of leadership. If I assume or believe that for me to be a good and effective leader, it's my job to tell people what to do, um, well, I'm gonna keep doing that until you can help me understand how shifting to a different approach to leadership, one that's much more um, evocative and supportive is actually going to help me be successful and help the organization be successful. So these kinds of assumptions and beliefs, we've got to be able to kind of illuminate them and talk about them. And lastly, we've got to be able to reimagine what a new success looks like. All right, and we've got to be able to do that together. To me, these are what I would call in the moment coaching skills. And these are just table stakes skills for any kind of large scale change that involves um, behavior change. So let's say you've got your people and you've, you've actually instilled these skills. Yay, fantastic. Well, now what? Now, once we've got them, how do we ensure that they keep them and that they use them? And I think the first thing that's really important to, to, um, to really instill for people is that they feel like we are in this together, right? So it's really important when you're changing behavior to have people go through in, in groups of some kind that can support each other um, and that you're creating an ecosphere around these new behaviors to support people to be successful. So that means all kinds of practice in different ways. Because you know, when we're changing behavior, what we really are doing is actually wiring up a whole new neural net for people, right? We are creating a whole set of new connections that people need to feel confident in doing something differently. And that means practicing in a lot of different settings. And I also personally believe it's really, really important to have peers supporting peers because safe, we have safety in numbers. If our peers are learning with us, then we feel safer about taking risks. 
We feel like we're the only person that's doing this. Um, it takes so much more motivation to keep going. So think about how you can um, incorporate using others to help to facilitate these changes. Um, and by the way, you know, I know from working with L&D that often um, you just don't have enough resources. You might be thinking, my gosh, we don't have enough resources for all this. And incorporating peers and others into the change process, I think is a wonderful way both to amplify the potential for success um, as well as get you your more resources in a very practical way to help. Of course, democratizing the learning, integrating um, change into what people are doing and really rewarding um, the, the process of learning. You know, if you think about it in those big project management kinds of changes, people get rewarded for the outcome right at the end, but in a process of learning and evolving to something new, you've got to reward the learning. So let's talk a little bit about how to make this really practical. So remember all those changes we talked about here in the beginning, all those things you've got to get done. Well, here's what I would like you to really consider is the possibility that you can actually attain two significant outcomes at the same time if you actually align these skills with these significant change efforts so that you're giving the people who are going to be taking on these new highly complex challenges the skills that they need to feel like they can do this successfully. And you can use this kind of um, system of change to support them both in building the skills and also talking about what it's going to take to make a significant change. So when new skills are used to build out the new world, we actually instill this way of thinking and being and acting together as a way of life. So here's what I would tell you. What I've just described to you is what I would describe as a safe and seen coaching culture. It is a place where people feel safe, seen, and they feel like change is possible. And I believe that when this kind of culture is in place, that behavior change at scale becomes much easier and more likely to succeed. What I want you to notice about what I'm describing here with this culture is that I'm not talking about what the outcomes are. I'm talking about how people feel, right? Because that's what really makes the difference. How does your culture feel? Do people actually feel safe to contribute the very best that they have to offer? If they don't, you're not going to see it. Do they feel seen for who they are and really appreciated for um, what is unique and different about them and invited to bring um, that uniqueness into these conversations? By the way, the reason that is so important is remember there is no roadmap. We are gonna to have to be so creative and collectively creative in order to come up with really innovative ways of addressing these evolving challenges. And that means you've got to be tapping into the creative potential of everyone in your organization. Everyone's voice matters. Everyone's perspective um, needs to be considered and included in some way in the conversation. If people don't feel safe and seen, that's not going to happen. And then they also, of course, as we've described, feel supported to take these new ideas, these new behaviors, and really step out and push the edge on what's possible. We only do that if we feel like we're not gonna fall over the edge, that actually someone is going to be there with us and help us. So I personally believe that when people feel safe and seen, they're going to co-create what comes next. And I think this is a really exciting time to think about what's possible and what can come next, but it's only going to happen if people feel like they can be in conversation with each other in very new and different ways. 
So let me just kind of wrap it up by saying that I think this is a really unique moment in time. Um, never before have we been in a place where the world has changed so much, so quickly, so collectively, that so many of the assumptions and beliefs that we had about what was, uh, how things had to be, have been shaken to their core, which means that we can really create some very new ways of thinking and being uh, together. But we're only gonna be able to take advantage of this time if we learn how to, to support people to think and act in new ways at scale. And again, I personally believe that the organizations that do this really well will be able to turn that fundamental capability into strategic advantage. And I believe that organizations that don't embrace these skills, that really don't put the effort into um, learning how to do this well, will be the ones who will fall behind. Particularly if you are competing in an industry where others have embraced these skills and are really making them their own. So it is my hope that what I've shared with you today um, will get you thinking about behavior change at scale, um, and will help you understand and, and, and maybe have a story that you can share with others to engage them in thinking about why this matters and, and why it is really worth um, devoting your effort to giving thought to. Um, so that's what I had to share with you today. Shirley, I'd be happy to take any questions that people have. Uh, yes, I have a few questions here and we do have time for that. Uh, the first one is, what is the best way to get traction with this kind of change? You know, I think when we're, thank you. I think when we're looking at behavior change at scale, um, I would say, first, work with the willing, all right? Don't try everybody all at once. Go to the division or the team or the group that is maybe a little more forward thinking. Um, and who would really have great value for doing some, you know, who need to go through a significant change and work with them. And I would say pilot ideas with them and take a little coaching approach to that change process, which is, you know, if things don't go as planned, ask yourself, well, what, what could we learn from this? How could we do things differently? And use that as a way of creating a great story, by the way, choose people that is gonna have a great story to share with, and then share that story to create enthusiasm with others. Um, I love the work with the willing. So I definitely wrote that down. <laughs> Easy to remember and, and really sticks out, very simple. But um, that, so that leads to um, the next question is, what should we do if our senior leaders aren't role modeling these new behaviors? Yeah, you know, that's really common. And, and I would tell, tell you, don't sweat it initially, <laughs> okay? What I would do, here's the thing, you know, we talk about it being safe to change. What a lot of people forget is actually the risk of changing is far greater with your senior leaders than it is with others, all right? So begin with the people who have value again for going through this kind of change and um, have them share with others how they're gaining value. And eventually that will kind of trickle up to the organization and the leaders will feel like it's safe enough to change. Um, I, just quick story, I had this happen, we were working with a large bank and the senior leaders were just really not on board. This is many, many years ago. Um, and, but, you know, there were people that were some really influential people in the middle, you know, people who were, who, were, who were like working for these folks who had a lot of practical things they needed to get done. And when they were able to instill, in this case, in the moment coaching skills as a way of life, it made a big difference for them. And they started talking about it. And eventually the leaders were like, what is this thing they're doing? And they wanted to learn it too. So again, when we think about safety, think about what's at risk and how can you help your senior leaders feel safe to change? I think is a, is a huge part of this equation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
time for a little bit more. How do we build and keep momentum with complex change initiatives? Yeah, great question. Um, well, so momentum, it really comes from people seeing change make a difference. And so I think things like capturing stories about things that people are doing different, differently is really important. Um, noticing the changes that it's making, often these kinds of changes are measured um, through your enterprise-wide uh, surveys and the changes that those make. So noticing how these are changing and rewarding people and commenting on things that are different. Um, and again, I think what would, I would really advise um, learning and development to reach out and make as many friends as you can in the organization and actually, you know, role model coming together with your change management organizations, with your senior leaders or others, creating networks of peers that are supporting these kinds of effort. And when you get that kind of layering of support, I think it helps to buoy everyone's efforts. Um, so it's kind of like, think of it like a change management project versus a training uh, initiative. And I think you can find ways to share the story and build momentum as you go forward. I love that you mentioned the role model part because I was going to ask if um, the, the, the point of uh, resistance came up earlier today in another session um, as it relates to change management. And so then you mentioned change management and everything kind of connected in my head. But, um, but in terms of resistance, I wanted to ask you if you had any best practices, um, examples. I imagine becoming a role model is one of those, but is there anything else that maybe people could take into consideration trying to combat that resistance or understand the resistance when it comes to this? You know, I think one of the most important things that we need to do is change our, our, understand, our assumption and belief. So we talk about, you know, we need to change assumptions and beliefs. One of the first ones we've got to change is our assumptions and beliefs about resistance. Typically what you're labeling as resistant is someone has been told to do something, the very behavior I described as not working, and then the person didn't change and they're, they're labeled a resistor. Here's what I would teach you from a coaching perspective. So we use a, an approach called untying the knot. And I say, when something's not happening, there's a knot. All right, and if someone's not engaging in something, there's often a fear or concern that's keeping them from moving forward. And rather than hammering on people, one of, again, one of these skills we've got to get really good at is taking a coaching approach to understanding why is this person frightened? Why don't they see it's in their best interest to change? Why don't they feel like they're gonna be successful at this change? What's getting in the way of them choosing to change? So we've got to take that as a, a creative challenge, right? And so when we do that, we instill a very different way of thinking, of leading, and of supporting people. And we've got to get really good at this if we're going to invite people to change in a significant way. 